Um, I'm really sorry about the delay, but we're going to make a start now. My name is Kevin Ho, I'm your host tonight, and uh, I'm also the speaker. So welcome to STC, Small Talk Circle for the June event. And um, this is a very special event because it's a seasonal finale. It is the last of this season. And so the next event will be opening in September when Phil comes back. And it's also special for another reason because usually Phil Learn, the founder of Small Talk Circle, would be here talking to you. But this week and next, he is actually in Canada with his family and enjoying the holidays. So he has asked me to look after his baby, which I'm very privileged. So thank you for coming. And I hope that tonight we're going to have a fun event because the format is slightly different. Um, but just before I start, I uh, just wanted to thank a few people. Um, so first of all, Phil would rarely get thanked because normally he's the one introducing himself. But it's fair to say that without Phil, we wouldn't be sitting here. Um, so he started the event, I think, about eight years ago and off his own back and nobody asked him. He didn't have to do it. He did it for the love of trying to nurture the next generation and trying to give a sense of um, knowledge about something beyond academics to the young people so that they understand that when they finish work, uh, finish university and, and study, um, it's not just about the academic knowledge that's going to help you um, get adjusted to your work life. There are so many other things. And I think these things you may not you know, get to learn about at the university setting. And so he created this platform to you know, mingle you between people like yourself and people like us who have been working in the workplace for a while, so that you can you know, have a free conversation about the things you want to know. Um, but more importantly, just to have a connection with people that may or may not be able to help you in your future. Um, so I would say Phil did it for probably eight years, seven years, and he did it on a very shoestring budget, and a lot of times he had to put his own money in. So I think he deserves a recognition and acknowledgement from, from all of us. Um, the second people I want to, feed, uh, want to thank are the events organizer today for AIA because without them we wouldn't have such a nice, comfortable venue and so I just wanted to give thanks to them. Thirdly, uh, last but not least, are the volunteers for Small Talk Circle who does a lot of work and you know, if you guys can look around and all of you would be taking pictures. They are the people who make the event happen, they are the people who are doing the logistics. We affectionately call them camels because they they carry the heavy weight, you know. Um, and uh, again, they don't get paid. Uh, they're doing it for the support of this event and for the support of this community. So I think a big round of applause for Phil, for AIA, and for Ken. And so before I get to the event, I just want to say a few things about um, networking because STC is a networking event. People come to me and actually we have a conversation that starts from each other as a human being rather than asking what do you do, how long have you done it, that kind of conversation, which is kind of commercial and it leads to transactional relationships. And if you look at a farmer, what they do, rather than a hunter-gatherer, they still grow food, okay? but they don't kill what they grow. They nurture what they grow. They put a seed in the ground, they put some water, let the sunshine come in, the air grow, grows, and then they wait. You've got to let time do its work in relationships. Sometimes. All good things can only come sometimes with all of the things that you do plus time. I think sometimes we, we undervalue the investment in our own time in letting something grow when we're trying to nurture something. So um, I just want to give that perspective to you that maybe tonight or maybe other networking event that you go to, instead of being so eager just to you know, make a connection, collect a card, and introduce yourself, try to speak to the other person as a human being. Try to establish a personal relationship. Try to care about who they are rather than just what they do. And maybe have a more in-depth conversation about their life and share your life because at the end, what good is a card that you collect if you don't remember who gave it to you? And who would actually proactively connect a card if they don't know who they are? It goes both ways. Imagine a network and four or five people, you're really just having a five minute you know, stand in for a circle in which you may not be able to speak. You may be just listening. Yes, you collect a card from the person speaking, but will that person remember you? So is that not really just a waste of time? Wouldn't it be far better 
rather than going, I need to get 20 cards, to have three or four meaningfully deep conversations with someone who aligns with your values, who are you know, in your line of thinking, you know, like-minded people, we say. Okay? So just a perspective I just want to share, and maybe you want to try it out you know, in the next event. So on to the main event tonight. Um, and because I'm the speaker, I don't need to introduce myself. <laughs> so you read something about me. Um, I've been in financial industry for about 26 years. 15 years of that last, uh, of that 26 were in a couple of investment banks. I was managing a regional business for them, trading derivatives, uh, for those people who knows what it is. Um, and tonight, instead of me, you know, sharing some of what I do and how I look at the world to you, I thought maybe it's a more interesting thing to ask someone who is quite close to you, who have just graduated, has got a job, and are able to share their experience of how they got a job, what happened during the interview, and what happened when they finally got a job? What is what is doing a job like? You know, versus what they expected. So I want to uh, for you to put your hands for, for my uh, special guest tonight. Three guests. So Young Green, please. Anson and Daisy. Thank you. As you know, they're all very good looking. I use you to trust my taste in people, right? Hi guys, um, nice to meet you all. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be here, and thank you, Kevin, for the invite. Um, so my name is Young Rin. Um, I'm Korean Canadian, so I grew up in Korea. I, I was born in Korea, grew up in Canada most of my life. Graduated university there, and um, I guess I started working in Korea first for about two and a half years, and then now I'm here in Hong Kong for about close, like slightly over a year. Um, what I do is I did uh, equity research before, then I'm now doing venture capital. Um, I'll like won't say where I work. Like it's not like I work at a really good company, but like look like, okay company in my mind. Um, but you guys, I can share more about what I do um, in the Q and A or network session after. Thank you, Anson. Um, hi, my name is Anson. Uh, I graduated university a year ago. I'm working in a tech firm now, where, which I'm going to disclose it because it seems like conditioning here. Um, born in Hong Kong, raised in Hong Kong, some uh, overseas experience, but not really worth mentioning here. I uh, think yeah, that's my, what I will introduce to the chat. Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Daisy. So I, I was originally from mainland China and I moved to Hong Kong eight years ago. So um, um, so right now I'm right, uh, no, I just quit my job as an equity research analyst. So I'm gonna switch to private banking investments. So still in the financial industry. Right, excellent. So first question is your first job, right? Um, tell us how did you approach choosing that role? in your first job or the company, what was going through your mind and what was the selection process like? Um, I guess, I'm not sure if it's the same here in Hong Kong, but if you go to like a business school in Canada or in the US, um, most of the top finance kids wants to do investment banking, like M&A kind of thing. I was sucked into that, uh, I guess, vortex as well. So I only looked at M&A. But then obviously, very competitive field, hard to get some experience there. Um, so I didn't get a job there. But then through some ne random networking, uh, one of my school alumni was a very senior guy at the company that I got into. And he just gave me a job in agri research as an intern. At that moment, I did not know what agri research was. He, this guy just was nice enough to take a chance on me and then give me an internship. Obviously, I wanted to impress the firm, work hard, uh, and convert that into a full-time offer. So, yeah, that, I guess that's the process for my first job. Yeah. What about you, Anson? Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Thanks. Hey, so mine is actually less well thought out. Uh, I essentially locked myself into my first job. Uh, 
uh, as well, it was basically, it was, uh, they, they were in our school doing talks and sharing our, our company like I was like, ah, this one looked good. Went for an interview, they hired me, I bought, don't even want to bother for looking for another one. And I just like, got into this one, which I, I luckily, I liked it. Um, I guess the only reason why I did that is because I hated, uh, really, really hated what I studied in university. I was an engineer, uh, industrial engineer. And it was um, I tried to be in the I tried to be in the industrial field, work in Japan for a while, but I didn't like it. And as a result, I just was trying to find any way to get out from there. Landed my first job, which I'm very happy that I struggled that way. But yeah, that's how I choose my first job, I suppose. Crazy. Um, for me, actually, I wasn't really good at like hunting job job planning. Um, when I was in university, whenever I needed, you know, I was studying finance, so I need to find for, I need to look for internships, right? Uh, I, I guess many of you have gone through that, but for me, it's quite hard to get an internship every time, but very luckily every time at the end of the, like almost at the end of the application period, I got the job. So same thing happened to my full-time job. Um, back then, I was interning with a with a startup startup hedge fund, but I wanted to leave because that firm wasn't that good. So, anyways, I was uh, like just applying for jobs online. What kind of questions did you actually ask your interviewer when they ask you, "Do you have any questions for me?" Just give us maybe one example of what you did ask them. God, uh, let me think. Okay, me answer your question first. Um, wait, wait, wait. Um. I think what I because I was a, I work in an IT consultant, and what I asked was, uh, what do you think your company will be in? Uh, sorry, how how would your company position yourself in the in the future cloud market? Right. I was trying to be insightful. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because I feel I, I will steal some of your point. Okay. <laughs> uh, before I was in an interview, I, kept, I talked to Kevin, and he was telling us that it was very important to try to show insight um, to the to interview, show that you are insightful to your job. You know, not only that you know what you're doing, you know what your com where your company stand, and you how would you react to that stand. And the best way to do that is by asking questions that you actually interested in. So I, I am very interested in technology, so I went online, search whatever that comes up on YouTube. First one I, I found, and I, I go to Google Scholar, I go to like find news, and I be well with searching that one topic. And then I start asking questions, and then he answer, I get follow up, more follow up, more follow up. I think as long as, I, I think if I wasn't ready, I couldn't actually get that question out. So by logic, I think by doing this way, I think the interview will be impressed by how insightful you are, or at least you try. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, I remember now. Um, so for me, I uh, same as answer. You want to ask very insightful questions. You want to know more about the company and the role. Um, it's just like you're look if you're looking for a girl girlfriend boyfriend, you want to know the other person more before you decide to be with him or her. So I asked the uh, I asked my interviewer uh, what's the like what kind of the role is about what kind of daily routine you're you're having here and um, and uh, yeah and how do you see yourself in a few years uh, yeah and uh, um, another important question is because I was applying for a program like graduate program job so I asked to, I asked you interviewer um, I heard that. Um, the program at the other bank works a different way because I, I I know people working there, right? So I was just very frankly asking him, uh, what's the difference between these programs? Why are you working this way but they're in that way? And by asking this question, I do know more about the value of this bank because the value will lead them to choose the program that the program structure that they are having right now. By this way, you would know oh, whether this bank can fit me or not. That reminds me, uh, let me do a quick poll. Yeah, right? sure, go on. How many percentage of what you learned from the university actually gets used in the real work that you are now? I would say like 10 or 15. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I won't say zero. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 20%. Okay. 
Now, this is not to say all of you should fail your subjects. <laughs> I'm just saying that in the real world, it depends on the jobs and depends on the role and depends on what you study. There could be a higher match. So there could be a very technical subject that you um, study and you actually are applying for a technical role specifically for that. That would increase the usage. But a lot of us, myself included, and I studied uh, accounting and finance, there really isn't that huge amount of you know, um, knowledge that you've gained from getting a degree that you could immediately apply and actually make it relevant for your work. So the question is, what is the rest of the 80%? which is the next question. If there is a subject or a skill that you wish you could have learned to better prepare you for the workplace, what would it be? Skill? Um, knowledge, subject, skills, whatever, abilities. I think, uh it will be a bit cliche, but it's still communication. Honestly, because uh, once you are working in a professional setting, is you will be. I, I was surprised that I don't know how to talk. I don't have a structure in what I say. I don't have consistency in what I say. So I would say book, and then I would say papers, and then I was actually talking about the same thing. Uh, and you was and. The impact done by bad communication was actually was huge. It's very, very big. Because no, I just didn't make a decision. Because uh, it, there was an interesting video that, that my company showed me when I was joining, um, I was in training work. It's like how much information gets deformed after it passes through like five, six mm -hmm. iterations. Mm -hmm. And if your communication is not effective, what you end up doing is wasting everyone's time doing something that the client might not want, mm -hmm. and also uh, wasting your own time and your own reputation. Mm -hmm. But furthermore, it not, when I talk about communication, not just about, I'm not just talking about speaking, delivering, and also listening. Mm -hmm. Because uh, my roles uh, circle around the uh, gathering requirement from the, from the customer. And a lot of time, you don't actually know what they're saying, even though you don't. You think you have the plan, and then you make an app out there. It's completely wrong. Do it again three times later, and they were like, "Okay, you don't even know how to listen. Just don't, don't, don't do this right anymore." Uh, it's only after it where I start, uh, I start taking notes. I don't start practicing in taking minutes. I start going online and researching on another listening course. Then I realize, okay, you, you. Then I actually got my listening style right. So I, I think communication, that's one skill that you can actually practice in university, but a lot of people do not. Yeah, yeah I totally agree with Edison, you know, like communication and presentation, because that saves you, time, saves you time and saves other people's time. Um, so I'll just add one more, uh, which is actually not a specific skill, it's more like a mindset that I want to acquire more before like, stepping into the, like, the real world. It was uh, the mindset, the resilience. So I think you really need to be able to bounce back whenever there's some setback coming at you or whenever someone scolds you for the mistake that you made. You really have to believe that, oh yeah, I, I made this mistake, but I, I need to find out how to solve this problem or how to get better and next time I will do better. You must have that mindset. And that mindset just, it doesn't come naturally. You have to practice. You have to go through, it's not like a single course can solve it, it's not like that. You have to go through like case competitions or just um, like take very, taking a very active role in your present class presentation. You just uh, use every chance that you can get to talk to people even if you get rejected. Rejection is good for you if you haven't graduated, you have to remember that. Just If you get as many rejection, rejections as, as you can, then congratulations, you would be more happier when you get into the real world. So just to build up that mindset. Very good point. Thank you. Um, I guess it's similar to what Anson said, but it's I would say it's soft skills because we're in Hong Kong. Uh, most like I bet ninety percent of the jobs that you're going to get it will be in the service industry, whether that's like professional services or not. So you're dealing with people, not only internally or externally, right? So um, 
like catching the cues of how people act and like just being respectful of others, whatever, whatever. Like soft skills really matter, and then that will actually make the difference whether you get a client or you get a promotion or whatever, right? Because if you look at like a finance job, I bet all the people that are quite talented, like they they're smart enough to do the job, but it's really about like how what's the relationship you have with your boss or like other people that are that matter in the firm that uh, you get the promotion or not, right? So that's all soft skills. Um, so I don't know if there's like. You can teach that, to be honest. Like it's hard to teach, uh, but if it's teachable, I would really would have liked to have that before going into job. I think you can start sense a trend here. Um, so the first thing is that the things you learn from the university isn't comprising the most percentage of what you need in the job, and what you do need the most isn't actually being taught. For example, the soft skills, communication, and I was trying to think about, because I kind of anticipated this, I was thinking about, well, what, what could you actually do um, to improve on that? And one of the things actually do what we're doing now, which is well, or what we're about to do, which is we're going to go mingling. I don't like to use the word network. It's too much about work, right? Uh, let's say we just mingle. There's a very fine line between a party and a networking event. Because you think about the commonalities of both, they both have a lot of strangers that you haven't met. They have drinks, they have food, sometimes they have music. Well, what's the difference? The difference is what you think you are expected to do and talk about during the event. But actually, if you are in the networking event and you're a participant, would you like for someone to come to you and talk only about business? Or would you like someone actually to treat you like a human being and talk to you about yourself, ask questions about you, care about what you do and how you come to be to begin with? Because that's what I was talking about uh, before we, we got into the event about sowing seeds of a personal relationship. And all of that, I think it would be difficult for you to understand now because you're not there in the workplace. You don't quite get what is it like in the environment where people are 10 years older than you, 15 older than you. You know, They live in a very different world, but you're actually sitting side by side. How do you relate to them? And how do you get them to relate to you enough to actually work well together? That they show you stuff when you don't know and you help them out when they need to. All those things kind of build up in relationships. And unfortunately, you know, there are no university subjects um, that, would, uh, that would actually teach you. So I would su suggest that at any you know, possible situation, that you reach out to get to know as many people that you don't know as you can. And practice building relationship with someone you don't know. Uh, indiscriminately, not because they're useful to you, but just because they're there, you know? Um, I think, you know, when I was your age, um, we know all our neighbors. Now, I mean, I don't know about you, but I hardly know any of mine, right? Um, we used to know people who are the gunayun, okay? And you call them by names, you know how many kids they have. Now, not that kind of level. So I think starting from that could actually be useful for all of us, you know, at any age to improve our relationship with the community that, that we live within. So, now, I'm gonna ask each one of you a personal question, which is only personal to you, right? So, Young Green, we talked about a little bit about the juncture that you're at in your career. Um, so I won't give too much away, but I, I, I would ask you a question about how you approach thinking about your career options now and the options that links between being employed or possibly being an entrepreneur, uh -huh. we talked about before. Yeah. And just give a little bit of context of where you are mm -hmm. and then maybe run us through your current thought process. Okay, so my uh, department unfortunately got shut down. So I'm technically not a venture capitalist anymore, but I would like to continue on the VC route. Um, and I need to find a job. So. Thankfully, my ex-boss in Equity Research still likes me, can give me a job, so I'll go back there temporarily. But my, I guess, um, passion is not with sell-side research. I want to stay on buy side, especially on venture capital, if I were to stay in finance. But, so I met with Kevin the other day to get some advice, and uh, having done VC and having done Equity Research, especially in the tech side, um, I really had like a thought for entrepreneurship. So I'm actually considering 
uh, tangible entrepreneurship route as well. Maybe uh, doing a startup through an incubi incubator. Um, I guess how I think about that process is first, like I have the easy route of just taking my old job with my old boss. Um, obviously that pays the bills. Um, I get to live a comfortable life, but in the back of my head, I will always think that, oh, I kind of like wasn't brave enough to really take a leap of faith in testing myself on entrepreneurship. So that's one route. Second is, okay, um, I can still live a comfortable life, but really do what I like, which is venture capital. So I'm looking into that area at the moment. So applying to jobs, talking to headhunters, et cetera, et cetera. And then third is, I really want to, um, so because my rationale for going into VC in the first place is, I will get to learn about startups, um, really get to interact with entrepreneur, like a lot of entrepreneurs in Asia, build my network, and then once I get some learning out, out of it, and get a good idea, or even find a, like a good programmer, maybe that's you, Anson, um, <laughs> yeah, and then I find my own startup, right? Um, so that was my thought process, and I only had like six months of VC experience that I cannot just go leave right now, but I could if I have a, val like a valid option of entrepreneurship. So that's like the three avenue, I think, how I think about it. And then, um, although I would say I wasn't like really brave enough to really jump in right away, I found an incubator that really helps on that process. So if I actually uh, have a chance to go through that, a uh, high chance that I will take that instead of the other two. Um, so, but I'm still waiting on uh, my options at the moment. So I guess, yeah, that's how I think about it. Thank you. Uh, Daisy, so you're about to embark on a new job. Um, so I'm interested to know what sort of brought you on to leaving your last job? Uh, what was your thought process? What were the things that happened there? And how did you conclude that this would be the, the new job that would be suitable, at least for now? Just walk us through a little bit. Um, so as I said, my last job was the, like also sales side equity research, um, equity research analyst. So, um, so there are several reasons that I wanted I wanted to leave the job. First, uh, I didn't see myself as a happy star analyst in the I don't know in the future in the next ten years. Uh, I know how they I know how their life is about. I know how they uh, interact with companies and clients. I just don't feel um, I just don't feel like there's a chemistry between me and that position. And the second reason is because I look around my environment. I observe the colleagues around me. So I feel like for sales and equity research, I, I don't know. At least at my firm at that time, I feel like lots of people are doing jobs that are some of the jobs are not really necessary, uh, trivial, but not necessarily useful and some of them are not really ambitious about this job. It just because it's just because it's good. it's very comfortable for them. And it's just their skill set, so that's why they the uh, that's why they stay in this industry. So yeah, I um, so I just feel like lots of jobs that I I've been doing wasn't really that exciting and doesn't really make a real impact. So that made me leave the job. And for the next job, I still want to, because I, at least for now, I still wanted to, I still want to stay in the finance industry. Um, so I'm, I was starting to think about what kind of other job that I want. Um, so for the next job, I want it because it's more, it's broader. It's not just focusing on equity market as I used to. It's more about all asset classes, including equities, bonds, derivatives, and even arts, real estates and you can have more access to all the assets that you're interested in because I'm more of a generalist, not a specialist. That's my personality. And the other aspect is for my next job, I also get access to face clients to talk to them about the um, investment decisions, the portfolios. So I kind of think about, uh, I kind of think about the two aspects, the investment side I'm interested in, the client facing side I'm also interested in. So I just use, yeah, just criteria to screen for my next room job. So here I am. And luckily I got that. Congratulations. 
very inspiring note. Um, I want to thank Youngrin, uh, Anson, and Daisy for first giving up your time, the second and most of all being so authentic and sharing something so deeply personal about you for the benefit of our student community. Please share a very generous applause for my very special guest. Cause it's going down